Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center's Infrastructure Week event. Uh, I was just commenting to our panelists that it's nice to be able to say the words Infrastructure Week without any hint of embarrassment or irony. It's actually a moment of kind of you know, infrastructure game on. So we are uh, delighted to be part of this conversation. Let me just try to kind of set the stage um, because there's so much going on. We're gonna have a little bit of a broader discussion than might have been uh, advertised. Um, I think, as everyone knows, the administration has proposed um, by their accord a $2.3 trillion infrastructure package. When we do our math, it looks a little more like a $3 trillion package over eight years, but a, a very big package of a very broadly imagined infrastructure. In the Senate, uh, Senator Capito and others have proposed a more traditional surface transportation $600 billion package. Encouragingly, both sides have already started negotiating with themselves. So the president has said he's open to smaller packages. He's made the point that he's only gonna support something that's paid for, which might be a limiting feature. Um, Senator Capito, you know, Leader McConnell have both started talking about 800 billion. So just you know, over the course of the last week, there's some more ambition there. So we're gonna try to have a conversation about what would, what should a bipartisan infrastructure deal look like? And just to tease the system a little, spoiler alert, BPC is going to come out with what we hope is a constructive, disruptive suggestion probably tomorrow on a, about a trillion dollar package that we think could really move through the, the regular order. And so unbeknownst to our panelists, we're gonna actually use this as kind of a real time focus group because I am joined by three people who know their way around Infrastructure Week. These are. Uh, Infrastructure Week warriors and people who have worked closely with BPC for a long time. Uh, I think you know them all well, but we have uh, Eric Cantor, former majority leader who co-chaired a BPC project focused particularly around private investment in infrastructure. Jane Garvey, former BPC board member and FAA administrator who also led that project. John Delaney, current BPC board member. You can tell we really prize people with infrastructure knowledge. John also, as you know, a congressman, presidential candidate, knows a lot about the infrastructure of Iowa. So if anybody really wants to drill down around that question, John is expert. John is currently leading a project for BPC, which we um, humbly call our Smarter, Cleaner, Faster Task Force, raising the question about whether we actually have the capacity, if we have the money, to build stuff. So. With that drum roll, um, let's start talking about the, the scope of this conversation. And maybe, you know, Eric, start with you. Um, what's infrastructure? You know, is it, is it fair to describe the administration's plan as infrastructure in the way that you've used the word over the last decade or two? Well, Jason, I, I would venture to say that infrastructure really like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I uh, do think that that is, uh, uh, the way that Washington is is viewing it right now, and um, I, you know, I hope that what happens is um, that uh, the bipartisan nature um, of the subject matter of infrastructure is what prevails in the end. So I assume what that means is that we'll see a narrower definition of infrastructure if we're going to see uh, a bipartisan bill result. And what I mean by narrower is. Um, a, a definition that encompasses the traditional physical infrastructure that we're all used to when we talk about uh, roads and bridges and airports and ports. And certainly in today's world, as we emerge from the pandemic, I would add to that uh, definition broadband, uh, because I think so uh, in, in such a real way, we've witnessed why broadband and digital access that it affords is such a critical piece of infrastructure for 21st century America. All right, so uh, Eric has gone beyond bridges and roads, put a little broadband in there. Um, John, you know, how, would you, uh, how far would you extend the infrastructure metaphor um, and you can talk about whether you're thinking about a you know, Democrat-only approach or a, a bipartisan approach. Well, I think uh, Eric was spot on. And it's, and it's great to be with you, Jason, and great to be with Eric and Jane. I, I would edit uh, Eric's framing around uh, it being in the eye of the beholder to say that it is whatever 51 votes in the Senate say it is, right? I think that's where we're ultimately going to end up. But I think he's directionally right. I, I tend to think of infrastructure as food groups. There's kind of transportation. There's energy. There's communication, 
There's education, I think, could be included in it. You know, those, those are the general categories of uh, infrastructure. And I tend to think this bill will land somewhere uh, around there. I do think the Democrats clearly are going to want to make sure there's kind of climate resilient infrastructure included in that. A lot of that is physical. Um, and so, you know, I think there's an opportunity to do a bipartisan bill that um, fits within what, uh, you know, some of my Republican friends would say is the traditional physical definition of infrastructure, but also appeals to some of the things that Democrats want to see in modern infrastructure, specifically around climate. And I think we all know the definition evolves over time. At one point, before we had airplanes, no one thought airports were infrastructure, right? So things change over time. A great, a, a great segue to the former FAA administrator. That's right. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that's exactly right. It's kind of been interesting to see how much oxygen has been taken up with uh, people just defining what infrastructure is. And that's uh, that's been a big part of the conversation. But I I'm encouraged to hear both Republicans and Democrats broadening uh, the definition, because certainly the, the economy has changed and uh, the definition of infrastructure has to change along with it, and I think it has. And I think both Eric and John's comments are to, uh, exactly right, heading in the right direction. Uh, I would add a resilient uh, uh, electric grid to that, having watched what happened in Texas and other places over the past year. So definitely including some of the, the climate change initiatives. Uh, and what I've been encouraged about is the fact that both parties are talking about broadening the definition of infrastructure. The real key is, can they find that sweet spot of a compromise where they can come together around not just policies, but what uh, what the cost will be and how, how uh, extensive they want to take it. But it's encouraging to see and to hear that there really is that kind of conversation taking place. And as you said in the beginning, uh, Jason, it's just terrific to have an infrastructure week without irony. We're really here talking about real things and real debates, so that's encouraging. We're going to have an eliminate the debt week in a couple of months, just so you all can feel uh, yeah. aspirational. <laughs> so I want to focus a little more on this scope question. I mean, again, if I'm treating this as a focus group, you know, a center of gravity of the conversation seems to be you know, a broader definition thematically, but a focus on stuff you build and. I guess if anybody wants to differ with that, do so uh, in response to the next question. Um, and I guess that is a question about um, you know, size of the package. So you know, there's a little bit of tricky work here around baselines, right? One of the questions, these, are, these first introductions are really not legislative proposals, they're, they're policy frameworks. And so the, the Republican package, the $600 billion package is including the existing surface transportation spending, which is close to 400 billion a year. So if one was trying to minimize the Republican package, you would call it a $200 billion additional expense. Shockingly, the administration is trying to diminish a little bit the impression of its proposal by not including baseline spending. So the administration's proposal is 2.3 trillion on top of existing spending. So we got a bit of a delta here. Um, John, you've been uh, recently in the process of trying to bridge differences in the legislative process. You know, how, how, how do you think about finding space between a half a trillion and a, you know, two and a half trillion dollar proposal? Well, to some extent, I think some, one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is, is we've become too fixated with the numbers, right? Like if you remember during the COVID debates, you know, numbers would be thrown around and people would almost ignore what's in the packages. And they would just say, well, they're at two and we're at five and that's the debate. So I, I think to bridge this gap, which I think is bridgeable, we've got to get back to what's in the numbers because not every dollar of government spending is the same. Some dollars of government spending produce huge economic multipliers, some don't. Some dollars of government spending go against things that only the government can do. You know, the best example is the military. Right. Other dollars of government spending are displacing private capital and competing with private capital. So I think what will ultimately happen in these negotiations is they'll get back to what has the highest return on investment, what is essential for the government to do, 
and what can most effectively leverage private capital. And I think if they get back to those uh, basics, then the size of the package becomes more almost self-evident, right? Because you've got people kind of agreeing with what, what's in it. And I think that's where we have to get to. Obviously, the headline number is going to come down somewhere in the middle because that's the story the media is going to want to cover if there's a bipartisan bill, like each side has to, you know, it's like that expression, the best business deals are ones where everyone feels a little bad when they're done, right? So we have to have that spirit here. Each side's got to feel a little bad. They got to feel like, you know, they landed somewhere in the middle. But uh, as you know, because you framed the question this way, Jason, you can play with these numbers a lot to, to give each side the ability to say that they, quote, won the negotiation, but it's got to get to what's in it. And that's where I'm hopeful, because I do think a lot of people in the Senate, and Eric can obviously comment on this, and a lot of people in the House have thought for a long time about this, and they have really strong views as to what should be in it. I'd like to see a little more innovation, infrastructure banks, things like that. Uh, but, but that's how I think they'll, they'll resolve it, by getting back to the basics of what's in it. So, so Eric, let me turn to you on this kind of bottom up what's in it question. Um, you, know, you mentioned surface transportation, broadband. To my mind, the next closest space is the clean energy infrastructure. In the Senate legislation last year, there were resources, you know, Barrasso's led bill for electric, electric vehicle recharging. We've clearly focused on transmission. The attack on the colonial pipeline has raised attention. Um, it seems that there's been a pretty strong embrace among Republicans of investment in clean energy technology. Not yet ready to go for a carbon tax or a cap, but legislation last year with Senator Murkowski and Manchin invested a lot in mm. clean energy tech and innovation. What's your sense of the potential for that lane to be part of a bipartisan? Outcome? You know, I listen, I, I definitely think if it were up to uh, my party on the Republican side, I don't think you'd see that uh, driving the bill. Uh, I, I, I think that you were much more, I think, appropriate uh, in your assessment that maybe the Republicans would respond to what happened in the Colonial Pipeline uh, just in the last several days and the impact that's having uh, along the East Coast. And so I, I think that, you know, and that, that raises questions about the nature of fossil fuels and our economy and where that leads. And if you're tilting more towards the clean energy piece um, and not worried about perhaps um, increasing the resiliency in our infrastructure that's related to uh, carbon and fossil fuels, um, I think that you're going to actually lose some uh, support on the Republican side. So I do think, though, Jason, to your point, this may come in a bipartisan uh, compromise. Uh, because if you go back to your numbers, and I know BPC figures on baseline and then goes from there, and I do think it's a little bit of apples and oranges, the way that both sides are, are calculating the amount of expenditure and BPC does, does it, I think, probably the honest way, <laughs> but, um, in, but you assume baseline. And I don't know if you can even assume that anymore, but if you listen to Mitch McConnell, he said, uh, he threw out there the term 800 billion. And again, it depends how you define 800 billion, uh, but you, would, you begin to see there some sort of upward limit um, of a Republican willingness to support a measure. Um, despite maybe what's in it. Because again, this was the ar argument that President Biden used about uh, the COVID relief bill uh, and the fact that what was in it was pretty popular because it was in direct response to the health pandemic. Um, at least some of it was. But yet my party said, there's no way we're gonna support something to the magnitude uh, of that package. And as you saw, it was strictly, strictly a democratic proposal and bill. So I, I worry about the size, and I do think that the size can be a detriment uh, if, um, if it gets too big, at least a detriment for the Republicans to support it. So we're, we're going to spend some time on, on politics before we wrap up. I will just note, I can't help myself, that polling reveals that people like free stuff, which, um, you know, to the extent that we were running the country by referenda would make it very popular and, you know, very broke. But I think that, you know, we are obviously grappling with this question about whether you can call something bipartisan if you actually don't have Republican legislators uh, supporting it. I think EPC, you might be shocked to think, is not quite there yet. Um, and Jane, I think it's a little bit outside scope, but 
just talk a little bit about the needs of air traffic. You know, I think that we understand that that tends to be coming from a different, you know, funding revenue lane, but how, you know, just so that we don't lose sight of that. What do you think are going to be the needs around airlines coming out of this incredible shock to the system? And, you know, what, is there a reinvention moment uh, for infrastructure around air travel that we should be thinking about? Well, I think it's really uh, raising a lot of questions for airlines, isn't it? I mean, whether the whole fundamental question about how much our business is going to uh, return to the office, how much are they going to return to travel to conferences and so forth. And, and every airline I know is, is, is grappling with that issue. I happen to be more optimistic about that. I think uh, Americans like to travel. I think the conferences, the sort of face-to-face -face, uh, relationships that we have continue to be so important. But I do think you're going to see um, airlines re-examining networks uh, and, and really re-examining where they want to uh, put their resources. Is it going to be more uh, friends and family travel? Uh, is that going to sort of offset some of the business travel? I think those are the questions that they're grappling with. But I do think it's interesting just to go back to uh, the whole issue of climate. What I have found particularly interesting in the airlines uh, in the last uh, several years is how much focus they are beginning to put on climate change and energy and those sorts of initiatives. You look at something, uh, someone like Scott Kirby, who has made sort of a, a signature, uh, you know, a signature uh, initiative of his, the climate. Uh, and we're hearing that from investors. Uh, 10 years ago, when I first joined a lot of the airline, I was involved in the airline business, you rarely heard that question from investors. You're hearing that now. What are you doing around climate? What are you doing around, uh, uh, you know, sustainability. So I do think that some of those really uh, changes that could be anticipated even in a surface bill, we're seeing in, 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 in airlines and airports as well and the kind of uh, projects that they're doing. Just one note, uh, LaGuardia, for example, that we're rebuilding right now, the whole basis of LaGuardia is going to be sustainability and environmental uh, initiatives. Just looking at, um, looking at the uh, numbers the other day for uh, the, uh, the, the garage that was just taken down, every 99% of that garage is somewhere else in the project. Yeah. So it's this, whole, it's this whole notion of what are we doing in terms of solar, what are we doing in terms of uh, some of the uh, water issues, the heating issues, and so forth. So it's pretty exciting. And I think it's going to be a model for what you can do in sustainability and resiliency and building some of the infrastructure of the, of the future. On behalf of everybody in this meeting who's spent some quality time in LaGuardia, I uh, thank you. Um, cool place now. It's a cool uh, place. <laughs> so let's now let's move to the you know the fun part of the conversation about paying for things. So maybe just uh, you know, Eric, I will start with you. Um, if I were to simplify the positions, the you know, Republican proposal is basically saying you know a user fee model which Democrats are calling unfairly regressive. Democrats are talking principally about raising corporate tax rates, which Republicans are saying unduly anti-competitive. Ideate for us a little bit. Uh, how, how would you imagine uh, space between those two ideas? Are there other options? And then we, of course, we'll talk a little bit about private capital before we're done with this discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, it's Jason, I, I still operate on the basic assumption that raising taxes uh, is not necessarily the way you can attract uh, Republican or conservative votes. And so uh, I do think that where um, a potential bipartisan bill will go, and I assume that the administration and then uh, Pelosi and Schumer are not going to allow for um, a, a, an infrastructure measure that would pass without any pay fors to attract Republican votes and then require all the Democrats to take the tough votes. I'm not sure that's going to play out that way. So I assume that there will be some pay fors And, you know, I, I think user fees have always been sort of a more conservative uh, uh, method of paying for things. Uh, certainly, um, when it comes to the increasing number of electric vehicles on the road, I know there's, there's growing support for uh, attaching some type of a fee so that electric vehicle drivers do pay their fair share on the highways. Uh, and, you know, there is this proposal also of indexing the gas tax uh, that could provide for some long-term adjustment in funding to any transportation measure. I think all those are up on the, uh, uh, on the table for discussion. Uh, but again, when you get into taxing corporate America or taxing 
uh, quote unquote, the wealthy, which as we know, $400,000, you're going to you're going to start taxing a lot of pass through entities that are small businesses. And, and that will, I think, increasingly raise the ire of the Republicans and will make it so that they can't support the bill. So hopefully, I mean, I, listen, I, I know this is a seasoned crowd in the White House. They've been around for a long time, as has Pelosi and Schumer. So they know where the sensitivities lie in terms of trying to make something bipartisan. So I'll tease that a little bit. I'm going to come to you, John. I just want to point out, Eric, you alluded to something quickly, which I do think is important, and that is the possibility that you could see a lot of the legislation, the priority move through regular order, and then some of the tough stuff, you know, how you pay for it, potentially could then move through a reconciliation process. So there seems like there's some plausibility that, you know, you could separate out those two aspects into one process, which would be obviously preferable than just trying to run the whole thing through a reconciliation. Um, so. Well, I mean, I mean, Jason, look, I, I think that any any effective plan for national infrastructure is, is not going to have that effectiveness unless you have some of the regulatory reform, the environmental uh, reform mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, per the permitting reform that are so desperately needed that we've talked about at BPC for years that you all have been great advocates uh, for that kind of reform. The reconciliation process with its limitations is not going to allow for a lot of that to occur. So I do think that it behooves the White House and, and Pelosi and Schumer to strive to make something happen under regular order uh, so that you can see these structural changes take place, um, which otherwise couldn't under reconciliation. And again, I'm not sure that um, the, the majority, and maybe John can speak to this, uh, that the majority is going to be favorable towards allowing Republicans to just vote for the um, for the spending and then have their members, um, which would require unanimity in the Senate and all but two or three votes in the House, have them then take the tough tax hike votes. I'm not sure that I would I would think they would allow that. But. All right, so John, just a couple places I want you to jump in here. Um, one is that there is this sense that, you know, there's two paths. One is you do the tough compromising for regular order or like, oh, you just go easy through reconciliation. And just a little bit of commentary, you know, Eric's making the argument that there's a lot of limitations to what you can actually achieve. You can raise the money through reconciliation, but he's arguing there are limits to how you actually use it. You know, do you see that as a constraint? You know, how do you see the two processes in terms of alternative approaches to the same ultimate goal? Yeah, I definitely see that. I mean, I think, Eric, I mean, uh, the margins are really tight. Mm -hmm. And you have these other difficult issues floating around in the Democratic caucuses, which is salt. Right. There's a lot of Democratic members who say they won't vote to raise taxes unless salt is uh, reinstated. And uh, I want to share that acronym for those who don't live in the oh, North. The, the, state, the state and local tax deductions, right, which enjoys, you know, almost no support from Republicans. Eric can correct me if I'm wrong about that. And increasingly doesn't enjoy support from Democrats, uh, including the White House, by the way, uh, because it's viewed as a tax break for the wealthy, which it largely is, not entirely, but largely is. So, but you've got a bunch of, you know, New York and New Jersey Democrats who are saying, I'm not raising taxes unless salt gets back in. And that's a huge problem because that's like a trillion dollars just in and of itself, right? So whatever the numbers you were talking about, you had a trillion to it, if you talk, so, so, that's the complexity. So, you know, I do think there'll be a, there'll be uh, that approach. I think there will be something done on a bipartisan basis. And then there'll be some stuff done in reconciliation. But again, it's going to be stuff that, uh, uh, in, you know, Nancy Pelosi believes that uh, her, her members can win the 2022 election on. Uh, it's going to have to be things that are popular at the end of the day. I probably, I agree with what Eric said about the Republican caucus and tax increases. I'd be I'd be curious on his views as whether there's some room there on corporate taxes and carried interest. Last I checked, uh, big corporations aren't particularly popular with Republicans these days. Um, so you know, can you get that tax rate back to 25, 26 percent with some Republican support? I could see a path for that, but he he'll have better insights than I do. But this is where I think we need some creativity because the one thing about the government and its balance sheet is it provides all kinds of ways to have lots of spending that doesn't cost as much money. 
Like we see that the, the greatest example of that is the GSEs, right? Which spend an enormous amount of money, but don't cost the government a lot of money. We see that with the SBA. We see that with all kinds of, of uh, areas of government where government uses its balance sheet and its ability to spread risk across l- large portfolios of assets and lower cost of funds. And that becomes a really creative way to finance infrastructure without spending as much money. And it allows Democrats to talk about the dollars that, the, I mean, if you set up an infrastructure bank that has a billion dollars of funding and it, and it turns that funding, you know, you know, three times over 30 years, you've created $3 trillion of, of funding, you know, so you get the ability to have these big numbers, but you can do it in a way that's more disciplined. And, you know, and I, I say this all the time, but I just think there's a, there's a tidal wave of private capital out there with a particular focus on uh, ESG and sustainability. And if, if some good minds are, are put to the task of figuring out ways to creating some of these innovative financing products that can access some of that capital, you could start seeing the bill get grossed up a lot, but the spending not be quite as much. And that's what there should be, frankly, more discussion about. And I, that's the one area I've been disappointed, which is um, it's almost like people are ignoring all that stuff and just figuring out how much money the government should spend. The government's got to spend a lot of money to get this stuff started, but it really should be thinking about how to leverage that capital. So, John, you have beautifully now brought us actually to the advertised topic of the event. Well, I was doing my best there, Jason. No, you're, you're a good friend. Um, I should just note, uh, we do have the ability to engage with uh, questions from the audience. If you would like to pose a question, you can either comment in the YouTube chat. We will be looking at those real time. You can also tweet a question using the hashtag BPC Live. So please get those questions coming and about 15 minutes we'll Look to those. Um, all right, so Jane Garvey, we've been talking a long time together about the opportunity to provide you know, additional impetus for private investment in public goods, public infrastructure. I think we had the shared premise that neither the government or the private sector have enough money right. by themselves to fix these problems. Just, it's been a while. So just set the, set the broad parameters of that debate and you know, what you think the opportunity there might be. Oh, I think there are tremendous opportunities there. And actually, I was to pick up on a couple of things that that both Eric and John said. First of all, John, uh, Eric's point about the importance of a number of these policy initiatives for Republicans, like streamlining and and uh, some of the permitting aspects that have been part of the work that BBC has done, as as Eric pointed out, for so many years. To me, that's critical. If you really want to bring the private sector to the table, so many of those initiatives are really important. The work that John just completed in his uh, Faster, Better, Smarter uh, report, I think, reflects all those recommendations reflect a lot of that. But secondly, the whole notion of are there more creative ways to think about it that John talked about. We've just used green bonds to uh, finance uh, the uh, one of the, the the heating and cooling plant at uh, at in in uh, San uh, in uh, Fresno State rather Fresno State University, one of the universities in California, and uh, we're doing that because uh, we uh, we will be. Uh, linked to a very aggressive uh, goal that they have to reduce their energy consumption by 33%. So our interest rates drop if we can uh, meet those goals and we're penalized if we don't. In Iowa, we're doing something very similar where we are, uh, we have an aggressive uh, energy goal with the university by 2020, uh, 2025 to transition from a coal-based uh, energy system, and we're working on research with the university to create sort of some new technologies and new innovations to do exactly that. So there are those opportunities that really advance both social uh, and climate goals at the same time that you're also uh, advancing some of these really important infrastructure projects. For us in the private sector, I think there are a couple of reasons that we're interested in it. One is for the for the environmental goals, which have been important to us and important to lots of the funds that are out there. John talked about the capital that's out there. We have all public pension funds. They love uh, the climate goals. But secondly, we are long-term partners in these uh, projects. We're we're 35 years, 50 years for our for our contracts. So for us, every investment that we make that advances our energy or reduces our energy consu- consumption, advances resiliency is really a positive 
uh, for our business model. So there's not, it's there, there are the, the, the business proposition is as almost as important as the, some of the environmental goals. So lots of good reasons to do that. Let me just push on that point, because again, I think a lot of the time the sense is you want private capital out of kind of just regret and necessity. You'll take the money, but you know, wish you kind of didn't have to, at least that's the imagination of some. These are public goods and only public funds should support them. But the point you just made is arguing that the actual private investments give you better outcomes. And I'm obviously yeah. leading the witness here a little bit, but the fact that so much of government investment is kind of, you know, build cheap and then let somebody else worry about it. Um, yeah. I stress more the importance of kind of owning and operating and how that changes the decision processes and where you invest. It does. And I, and, and actually I think as, as, uh, as the, administration as Congress begins to look at legislation, I hope they look at this whole notion of life cycle costs, because I think that's been sorely missing in a lot of the discussions that we've been having. There has to be a commitment to life cycle costs. Uh, and, and that really is, I think, uh, one of the basic premises for good infrastructure investment. Uh, if you're thinking long term, then you really are going to build in some of, of the elements that we've talked about. So. So I think that's really critical and important. Uh, and I hope government does it, by the way, through incentives. You know, if you're, if you're caring about those sorts of things, linking it to incentives as opposed to directives, uh, I think is, is, is probably a, a better approach, at least certainly in our experience. So Eric, I want to bring you on this because you have also long kind of evangelized the need for combination of public and private resources. And what, what would you add about the opportunities to bring in private capital and, you know, any thoughts about particular policy changes that would actually encourage that to happen? I be on mute. Uh, part of the work that BPC has uh, been well known for now is um, to think of ways that we can direct policy towards inducing private capital. And I think you've been so targeted on this notion that the need so far exceeds um, the, the willingness for the government at least to spend. Now, let's see, we've, we've broken records this year in terms of spending or seeing Washington do that. But I do think and agree with Jane that, you know, to bring in sort of the prowess um, of the private sector when you begin to think about some of the needs that are out there um, and, and private capital does um, look at itself as um, the uh, and private actors look at themselves as a way to to uh, pick up in terms of um, its its higher cost of capital versus the government, but being able to do that by the efficiencies that it can create. And but you know if you look at now um, the uh, number one and John talked about the availability of, of equity capital out there, it is extraordinary. I mean it's it's trillions of dollars waiting to be unleashed probably seven, several hundred billion dollars um, of just dry powder um, uh, ready to be unleashed uh, on the equity side right away if they had the opportunity to do it. Uh, and then on the, on the debt side, I mean, there's direct lending funds that are out there looking for opportunities uh, in the infrastructure area. Uh, and as we know, debt investors are facing global situation where most of the debt, I think 80% is below 2%, yielding below 2%. And you've got, I think, uh, $10 trillion of debt that's negative return. So this is an opportune time to put committed capital, long-term capital to work to solve our infrastructure needs. You know, and I keep hearing, though, from, um, you know, the part of our clients um, that, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just the lack of opportunity. And this goes back to this notion of, you know, what can we do to ready the, uh, the playing field for all this private capital? And, and if, if you're thinking about what needs to be done, well, we talked about the permitting processes. We've talked before about reducing the political risk for the private investor, uh, because that is something that can't really be quantified uh, and it has been a real impediment to the dedication of capital towards this sector. Um, but we've also seen um, the ability for states and even smaller localities to actually take an inventory of their assets and what's needed it falls far short of what should be going on. So all of these type of things and directives and assistance and guidance um, should be there in an infrastructure bill. 
And again, it, it, it cries for the need for regular order uh, because all of this cannot be accomplished through reconciliation. Uh, and hopefully, um, I think the administration, um, you, you mentioned, Jason, the, the thrust is often that this is public good. We can't let private sector in on it. Hopefully, that sort of traditional orthodoxy on the left doesn't rule the day, because I think this is a perfect time to leverage the debt and equity capital that sits there in the private sector uh, and to lend uh, some of this sophistication and prowess of investment to um, so much that is needed out there. And see, this is where we need some creativity, Jason, right? Because I, I agree with everything Eric is saying, everything Jane said. But like one of the things that we talk about is, for example, building a national network of charging stations for electric vehicles which I consider infrastructure, many do, maybe not everyone. But you look at that and you say to yourself, well, private capital can fund a lot of that, right? It can fund it in San Francisco and other places where there's a lot of electric vehicles. But private capital probably can't fund all of it, right? Low-income communities, for example. So if the government had a loan guarantee program, for example, that said for certain areas of the country, you can get a guarantee to build charging stations, um, and by the way, if you, you, you also get accelerated permitting if you do that, if you access this guarantee program. A program like that wouldn't cost the government a lot of money because what they're really underwriting is timing, right? Because I think everyone envisions in 20 years, these charging stations will do just fine, but it's very hard to underwrite between now and then. So the government comes in and, and applies government capital where it's really needed, but then it lets private capital flourish. A program like that probably doesn't cost nearly as much money as the government building all of these things, which they probably won't do as efficiently as the private sector would, but it allows the government to take a risk that is preventing these things from being built and take that risk off the table, right? So in all these projects, you got to look at it and say, how do, we, how do we build all the stuff we want to build? What can the private sector do? What can the private sector not do? And sometimes what the private sector can't do is like a piece of the capital structure that if that problem was solved, the rest could fit in. And that's what I think has been lacking in this infrastructure. I mean, I, listen, it sounds silly, but I'm surprised no one on the Hill has said, you know, in 2008, we bailed out the GSEs. We bailed out Wall Street. And the government owns like 30 or $40 billion of that stock right now. Right, which why don't they take that stock, sell it, take that money, put it in a new infrastructure bank? And, and let's take the money that we got for bailing out Wall Street and use it to build Main Street infrastructure projects and then create a, an infrastructure bank, which suddenly wouldn't cost us anything because we've got that stock, right? I mean, we just need, I'm not saying that that's even a good idea, but I'm just saying no one is putting forth ideas as to how to take the government money and get it leveraged as much as possible because it is a false choice, right? You need, you need the government money for some stuff, but the private markets can do a lot. So we ought to figure out how they work together. And that's what I think has been missing. And, and, and interestingly enough, we have some elements in place. I mean, the TIPIA program is a huge huge success. hugely successful. Yeah. And if that were expanded, if PABs were expanded, there are, there are a number of those uh, uh, credit programs that I think have been, uh, you know, could be could be expanded and used, particularly for things like uh, that John just talked about, which is exactly what happens in Europe, by the way. So I think using that model here, or there's something to be learned there that we uh, would really be important. One other point I want to go back to that 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 um, that Eric touched on, and that's the whole question of risk. I think one of the parts that's been so discouraging for the private sector is understanding how do we share risks. Uh, and I think as, as John alluded, you know, there are risks that should be borne by the private sector, some that should be borne by, that uh, uh, have to be borne uh, by, the, by the public sector. And, and I think sometimes there's been the assumption that all the risks shift to the private sector. I am delighted to see that there's many more conversations taking place about how do we adequately share risk? Where do they appropriately belong? Great credit to, uh, to Greg Slater in Maryland and uh, Governor Hogan, who have begun talking about this in earnest and how do we take projects that uh, are pretty complicated and share the risk with the private sector. So those kind of conversations as we go through this debate will be very important as well, I think. All right, so let's get to my currently favorite topic, which is the, the need for speed and recognize that for years we've had kind of a you know, 
proxy fight over climate change with the premise simplistically that industry wants to build lots of stuff and communities are burdened by those troubling things. And so people use the you know, NEPA process to slow things down. Fast forward to the idea of um, entirely decarbonizing the American economy, achieving net zero emissions in now 29 years. And the recognition of just the profound scale of that challenge, right? Requiring us to build infrastructure many times faster than we ever have before. There is therefore some different imagination about this discussion. People are finding that the energy transition, the move from fossil energy to renewable power is actually being in many cases thwarted because you just can't, you can't build things, right? So the timing imperative there seems to have changed the debate a little bit. I think Jane and Eric, you made the point that political risk is amplified when it takes you know, five or six years to move from project conception to construction. Usually you'll have an election or two between that moment, which is a inflection point for risk. So John Delaney, you, along with colleagues, uh, Bobby Jindal, Colette Honorable, Bill Truix, Rick Santorum, and Julian Castro have joined together boldly, proudly to create the Smarter, Cleaner, Faster Task Force. Recommendations were released, uh, I guess, yesterday, trying to suggest some steps that were necessary. Before going specific, just a little bit of a, like, this is a tough conversation, a little bit of a political frame for how we were able to convince you to put your charm, innovation, and good looks into uh, this project. Well, considering I have very little of all three of those categories, it wasn't a hard decision. Um, but um, so look at, I, I mean, I just think you either care, you either believe these are issues or you don't. That's how I think about it, right? It's the same discussion I have with people around direct air capture, right? Which is you either think climate change is an issue and if so, you need to look at the math and realize we won't get to net zero unless we suck a certain amount of the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Therefore, we have to support it. But other people view it as a way of continuing the fossil fuel industry, right? So you either believe climate is an issue or you don't. Uh, and if you actually believe it is an issue, you must have a sense of urgency. And if you have a sense of urgency, uh, you then start focusing on how you do things faster. And I don't think anyone believes that we can streamline permitting and, and, and not still do it to a high standard, right? I just think people, just generally in life, if you give people two years to do something, they do it in the last three months. You know, that's just the way everything works, right? We all know. Teenagers. Yeah. yeah, we all know this, right? We all do it. So, you know, so I think you have to, you, you have to basically say, I'm not going to compromise standards, but I'm just going to push the process. And, you know, so you get rid of duplication, which is what some of our work has done. You put one agency in charge, you give people timelines and you hold them accountable, uh, which doesn't mean they sometimes don't need exemptions or exceptions to the timelines, they do. But I think it's, it's a combination of things, right? It's basically, you know, having real timelines and holding people accountable to them. Having it be one agency take the lead because when you talk to people who have had problems with re the regulatory regime, what you often hear is duplicative regulations, duplicative regulators, right? That's a very different, that's a very difficult problem. So you want one agency leading the charge, you want a, a defined time frame, and you want to define clearly what has to be done. Um, you know, and I think you, you've got to be able to make the case that unless we accelerate the development of all these projects, we're not ultimately going to accomplish the goal. All right, so Eric, you led off uh, with this issue. I think when you look at the kind of politics of the infrastructure debate, you know, conservatives, Republicans, you know, have always supported infrastructure, but you know, this is really a core theme that's been around for a long time. It kind of, you know, it, it stirs the soul almost to the extent that climate change does so for progressives. So I think you know, we have imagined, as you implied, this needs to be a significant part of the conversation. Um, so I want you just to speak broadly about that, but also acknowledge that you know, John just noted a number of our proposals, which are very constructive in the near term. I would acknowledge that probably not adequate to the task, right? If we're truly going to fundamentally you know, modernize the American economy in a couple decades, we probably need to do some things that are even a little more disruptive. And some would probably empower the federal government to force national priorities um, in a way that does not rely as much on 
state and community rights. You know, just how do you see this? I mean, can, are, is this permitting debate going to be fiddling around the edges? Do you think there is a conservative imagination for a, just a much broader rethinking about how we modernize the democratic process as we try to modernize the physical infrastructure? Well, Jason, I, I just sort of um, take note of the political realities of the day, and I go back to stressing the B and BPC, Bipartisan Policy Center, and I do think it's really important, not just for the end goal of the infrastructure package, but for the country to begin to see, you know, Congress can work together again. And, you know, a lot of what John just said needs to happen, I think came out of uh, the committee that he chaired, um, is essential to delivering on the goals um, of a smarter, cleaner, brighter future. But it also, to your point, Jason, is something that has been orthodoxy on the Republican side for a long time. So I see in the makings of, of, of regulatory reform and approval, streamlining and permitting, and um, uh, I see a potential for a bipartisan deal. And we've already said there's so much private capital out there. Jane talked about the import of sustainability and the E and ESG as far as the investing community, the public investing community is concerned. You've got all the elements there that capital can be unleashed if we just get the impediments out of the way. And in fact, if you do that, so you check the box for conservatives and you say, fine, we will clean up this bureaucratic overhang and the duplicitous nature or the duplicative nature of, of permitting that goes on and on and on uh, and streamline that for projects of work. Um, and then you will have, uh, again, a much, much more inviting playing field for the investor in the private sector. You'll have a much more straightforward avenue for the public sector to pursue the goals to, uh, that John is talking about, if that's what they so choose at the state and local level. I mean, it's just a win-win-win. So I do think, again, it just talks about, I mean, this this completely underscores, again, the importance of having a bipartisan measure that you can actually do some of these substantive changes. You can undertake some of these changes and get them written into law and don't be, and not be handcuffed by the reconciliation process. So Jay, I wanna ask you to talk a little bit about some of the community aspects of this. You've really overseen the construction of a lot of major projects. Something we've talked about over the years is the importance of community voice in citing. I think the administration's you know, righteous focus on environmental justice, the assertion that you know, upwards of 40%, for example, of I think the clean energy funding, the administration hopes to see um, move towards disadvantaged communities. Do you, you know, the, the challenge we have is that we have communities that have been underserved. And if we slow everything down, we're basically locking in a process of the status quo, which underserves them. So the goal is to speed things up, speed things up right. You know, bring projects that communities want to provide the employment and the environmental quality. I guess, you know, just how do you think about that choice, the, the need to have real democratic local engagement and everything that we just talked about, which is how cumbersome that has become? Well, it has become cumbersome, but I'm, I'm just a couple of examples. One is that uh, I just want to think, think back to some of, the, uh, some of the catastrophes we've had around infrastructure and what has government done in those cases when we had the Embarcadero in California so long ago in the 90s. Uh, a government went in and in a matter of very short period of time, they were able to rebuild that very quickly. So to go back to that point, the elements are there for, uh, to get this work done quickly and to get it done in a more streamlined, in this more streamlined way. Uh, the, the whole issue about community involvement and when, uh, when projects, uh, where projects should be built and what's the impact to the lower to 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 so the more disadvantaged communities i think is extremely important and if you look at any project that has been undertaken in this country that has been successful community involvement and community participation has been a key part of it, it hasn't necessarily meant that it slowed it up as a matter of fact sometimes it has been part of the sort of uh, consensus to push it forward uh, the Long Beach port Courthouse that we were involved in is one that has sort of revitalized an area that was very, very impoverished, very difficult neighborhood. And there's been close collaboration uh, between, the, uh, between the courthouse community and the community around it, the schools and so forth. So, uh, you know, it can act as a kind of catalyst for a neighborhood. Uh, the Miami Tunnel Project, when we were 
thinking about that project. We had to think of a connection between the city of Miami and the port uh, of Miami. But the, the real challenge was to deal with it uh, and to be able to take out uh, the truck traffic from a very congested neighborhood. We were able to reduce the truck traffic by 80%. The neighborhood in that case was embracing the idea because they saw the real value in getting it done. So I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive, but I do think there has to be the involvement very early on uh, for the, for the uh, community. Where I think it gets cumbersome is when you have lawsuit after lawsuit. There's got to be a timeline to some of these. There's got to be uh, there's 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 got to be a limit to, uh, and we've certainly seen that in Maryland, for example. There's a lawsuit that tied things up for for over a year. So I think some of those uh, some of those elements are make it much more challenging, and probably something uh, I'm not sure we're going to deal with all of those. But the early community involvement and in helping to develop these projects, I think, is really key. So I'm going to turn now to the, the questions. We've gotten a lot, and many of them are on the same kind of theme of uh, the political moments. Let me see if I can just, because uh, I, I will try to clue several together into the following um, question. And that is noting that around the American Rescue Plan, there was a very short-lived bipartisan moment. An offer was presented, a conversation happened, and it was almost rejected before you know, folks got back into their Ubers. Mm -hmm. Is this moment different? Right, I think Senator Capito is going to go to the White House tomorrow. The president is convening the the leadership. It it seems like it's a little different, but you know, I think I have a selection bias running the uh, bipartisan policy center. So, broadly, to any of you, do, do you think that the ambition for compromise is actually strong enough to have a different kind of engagement than we saw around the rescue plan? Well, I'll start. I think there is. I mean, look at I think. The, uh, the president ran on a very specific promise about what he was going to do with COVID. Uh, you know, COVID is obviously not a normal situation. And I think his desire to just get that done uh, was, was justified. And I think that allowed him to stay on brand because I do think that was viewed in a different category. And as Eric said earlier, it was very popular. So he had the benefit of public opinion as Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. He had public sentiment on his side, uh, and he had promised this very specifically. I do think they are thinking about this differently, and I think they will be more intentional uh, and trying to do it in that way. And I think many senators are as well. So I do think it's different. Eric, you know, Eric? Well, I, 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 listen. I think that the um, uh, the 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 nature of what they're talking about, and that is a quote unquote paid for or partially paid for infrastructure bill, um, by by its nature makes it more difficult uh, to get done. And so I, it's not the giveaways, as I think uh, you know, John or somebody had said earlier that you know free things are are popular, but. You know, this is not going to be for free. Yes, infrastructure is popular, uh, but if they're going to attach, um, you know, the pay for exercise to this, it's not so easy. And frankly, even if, um, you know, you assume the Democratic Party has the reconciliation option at their disposal, it's a tough hurdle to climb. I mean, just thinking about unanimity on such a package in the Senate, not one Democratic senator can vote against it, including Joe Manchin. Uh, and, and then in the House, given the historically close mo uh, margin um, that Nancy Pelosi has, it's not a slam dunk at all that they can do this. So that's why I do think that it's different this time. And there is at least rhetoric pointing to or signaling that maybe they are interested in having a bipartisan process. We'll see. And, and don't don't discount the inflation discussions in how this plays out in these negotiations, in my judgment, at least. And Jane, mm -hmm. you've watched this for a long time. Are you? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, and maybe I'm being more optimistic than I should be. But I I I think it is there is a moment here. I do sense a difference. I'm encouraged by the kinds of conversations that you see taking place at the highest levels. I've been encouraged by uh, uh, comments. Uh, across the aisle about how important infrastructure is. And I do think there's more confidence today in government, perhaps because of some of the 
uh, rollout of the of the of the uh, vaccine and so forth. But again, I may have uh, a bit of a bias myself. But it, it, and I think Eric is absolutely right. It's not easy, and it's going to be very challenging and very uh, difficult. And there's not much room for any missteps. But it does feel more encouraging to me right now. All right, so a couple of things before we um, close this down. I think one of the implicit understandings about infrastructure is that it has tended to be broadly supported because it's local, right? We all have our own experiences of underwhelming infrastructure. And so just to kind of animate that kind of public sentiment, um, the Bipartisan Policy Center has announced a, a new competition. Um, Greg, I think you might want to share the screen. Um, we're basically... Um, Challenging America to tweet us your most compelling pothole. Uh, we ah. are, um, this is the standard that has been set so far. The rubber ducky need not acquire, but you know, a real, you know, don't go onto Google Maps, like something in your neighborhood. We want to know where it is. We want to know your experience of it. The backstory will help. Uh, the, the winning entrance, uh, it's going to be a week long contest. Uh, the winning entrance will get a $250 gift card. We suggest that that go towards a tire alignment, a chiropractor, or possibly a, a new bicycle, but that's going to be ultimately up to you. We will be featuring um, these um, potholes on our website. We are going to also share the winning entrance with the Secretary of Transportation and uh, key leaders of committees. So there's an opportunity to you know, bring some attention. Earmarks are back, folks. So not a bad moment to make the project uh, well known and notorious. So we will be uh, following up on that. Um, secondly, uh, just tremendous appreciation to um, three panelists, three great friends, three folks who have put just a tremendous amount of their own intellectual creativity into these exercises. Um, and lastly, just note that, uh, as was mentioned, we did put out some uh, pretty specific recommendations yesterday that I think uh, are and will be available in the chat. And just to put maximum pressure on my own evening and the BPC team, um, be looking around tomorrow for an actual effort from the Bipartisan Policy Center to disrupt the middle of the debate a little bit by making a proposal that we have no ambition or imagination will be exactly followed by the Congress, but basically our attempt to kind of you know, set the frame for what a constructive debate might look like. So um, you know, I will, uh, spoiler alert, it's about a trillion dollars and it's paid for. Um, with that, my friends, thank you all for uh, 2021 Infrastructure Week. And uh, hopefully next year we will be reflecting upon the major piece of bipartisan legislation that was passed and talking about government's effectiveness in spending those resources. So until then, thank you all and have a good evening. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.